More and more companies today are using Code EA for visualization. They are using Code EA for web application development. And they are looking to Code EA for solutions to other complex industry problems. This last part of our summit is dedicated to Code EA technologies that go beyond data interoperability. We'll start this section from a panel discussion about the role of scan to beam in the AAC industry. In the scope of our summit, you can see a part of this discussion with bright insights. But I'd like to assure you that it's worth watching a full version available on our YouTube channel. You know, looking at your practices in general, um, how often is your company seeing projects where there is a need to create models from these scans and the point cloud data? There is definitely an increase in um, demand for the use of this. It's to the point that basically every project now in the last couple of years has had some form of scanning, whether it's to um, scan to BIM. Uh, the last project was a substation in a basement uh, with, with complex floor and ceiling and wall condition. Where we see the greatest value is in those retrofits, those renovations. Um, uh, Walsh has three different verticals. It's our building group, civil group, and our water group. And water time and time again when you're massive upgrades how are you retrofitting this existing facility with new pipings new filtration systems new processes so really having a granular view on how this is going to integrate into the current process and procedures is very difficult and you know you can go out there and take a tape measure and measure it but you know that really doesn't provide um great hindsight uh, when you're throwing these models together um, as well as how you're going to get this information or this equipment into these spaces yeah for us it's, it's very similar um, we've deployed point cloud technology for the last decade um, via, via either laser scanning directly or um, increasingly with with drones to capture the larger type sites and I tend to look at it from the building lifecycle perspective. So I always like to start with why. Uh, why do people want to do the scan? In the front end of the design uh, construction process, you have the as-built condition. So a lot of the fr front end laser scanning work that we've done in the past has, has been around capturing the as-built condition. Uh, for example, uh, we did MAM International Airport which had an extremely large uh, footprint, you know, it's an airport, of course, and it was built where nobody really trusts the as-built documents because they go, I need 10, 20, 30 generations, you know, they're like, you know, you got, do you want the 1975 version or you want the 1982 or do you want the 1994? Um, and they recommend you look at all of them because they all have li different pieces of information on them, but none of them have the truth. So, because you can't trust the as-built documents that we're inheriting from the history of that building, uh, and people want the confidence to truly know what's out there, we've been scanning to document the as-built condition. Something for us that, that, that is important is the scale. Uh, we have some projects that you know, we have towers that we want to do a retrofit. We're definitely going to do that. But there is also a niche in, in a, a practice area that we call workplace. And, uh, and there is some smaller spaces. And uh, and we see the drones, as Gene mentioned. Uh, we see the point clouds. We see all, all type of 3D scan. But there is no um, a tool that help that small niche. When you have to 3D scan something, you don't want to send your team there. But you need to capture the space. So, so there is a lot of opportunities in the, air, in the, in the field. We have seen increasingly, um, I would say probably 100% of the projects that we have that are existing conditions they're doing through this kind maybe you can uh, help also describe what is your process I mean are you are you going out and doing the laser scanning yourself with your own units are you hiring somebody third party to do it are you then getting the point cloud data and and translating that yourself or is that also a third party service what you know what kind of things are you relying on uh, depending on the complexity of the project um, the availability of our scanners, you know, that's that's always a uh, difficult thing to approach. We have multiple scanners within our organization, but um, 
you know, we have a retrofit project comes up, you know, that's, that's just like a full-time FTE that's sitting there and that's being leveraged on that project. Uh, one of the banes of our existence is when we hear we need to perform laser scanning on that project. And then the first question that comes to mind, are we creating the model? Oh no, the architect's creating the model. No problem. We'll go scan that. That's we're completely fine with scanning that project because that's the easy part. Scanning and registering those points, no problem. Uh, the complexity of really developing that model, that's time consuming. And uh, unfortunately, these days in the industry, it's you're closing up one project, starting up another project simultaneously, and bidding a project in between the two of those. So um, it's very difficult to kind of stop do all those iterations and go through it. From the architect standpoint, um, we've seen a couple different variations. Um, we've never done our own scanning. We're usually contracting out. It's either with the general contractor um, or it is coming from an outsource um, firm of some sort. Uh, and then from that point, once we've done the scan, we have both modeled in-house and we've also outsourced the model or the general contractor has provided the model from their scan. A big point, and it's, it's something we've toyed with as far as the, the model conversion. It's something that we used to handle all of that in-house. Um, the software years ago has been developing where there's automatic feature extraction. Um, but what we found is, particularly with piping type systems, the software will create those elements, but then you spend just as much time QCing and making sure everything fits properly that we weren't really seeing the, the efficiencies to make that process go. And that's that's kind of what, why we're here talking about this. The, the industry has been chasing this magic button where Point Cloud allows us to capture more data than we've ever had on the construction site and then with drones as well. But the ability to efficiently convert that to a model is is something that really holds a lot of people back. So what, what will be the role of automation in 3D scanning? Because we all face the same challenge. When we go and we scan, we get a lot of information that we probably don't need. So, for example, um, I get a 3D scan, I come with a bunch of piping that has, they're, they're not really relevant for let's say the scope of work that we're doing. I wonder if in the future, some kind of uh, algorithm is going to start understanding what is piping, what is a wall? You know, it, it should be something that it start filtering those things. We, we have seen some automation where you understand what, the, what type of geometry is there and say, okay, this could be a wall and it, ter it, and it throws a wall there. Um, sounds like cost and the time associated with A, making the scans and B, making those conversions is a very big deal. Uh, you know, obviously not every, not every type of stakeholder, you know, if you're an architect and you're focusing on design, that may not be feasible within your firm or, you know, sounds like on the contracting side, you figure out ways to make it work because that is a part of your process. That is a fundamental part of what you do in being able to do the scanning, but maybe conversion isn't always necessary. Or if you could get conversion on top of that as a, as an easy gain, then it would be much easier to, to justify. You know, so, so ODA is, is, you know, in this, this realm of trying to provide sort of these core technologies that fill these gaps. Um, but what do you think about that approach? I mean, does it does that seem to make sense to you rather than sort of waiting for, you know, each of the individual vendors and sectors to just sort of figure it out? <laughs> well, yeah, I think there's a need. So it's interesting because um, one part of this is how do you consume the scan data, right? One of the issues that we've always had, uh, of course, you know, when you talk about a uh, laser scan of an airport, you can imagine how difficult this is to consume. In every sense, hardware, just transferring the information, making it accessible, making it available, bringing it into other systems. So we obviously need more optimized ways of being able to make that data available in a wide range of platforms, in a wide range of environments. Everything from a you know, tablet computer all the way up to your smartphone. You're seeing movement on the laser scanning side of things. You know, it's everyone's got the newest, latest and greatest cell phone or iPad, and they now all of a sudden have laser scans on them. Nobody knew what the heck they were going to do with it. You know, it was for the AR, so you can have a little dancing rhino on your desk. But then people in our industry started being like, wait a second, I can now 
work with an interior designer. I could scan my apartment, send it off to interior designer and get a beautiful decoration of my apartment. Well, if we could do that in our personal level, why, why aren't we trying to holistically approach this in our industry to make it easier? If I can go out there with an iPad, all my sub or all my foreman have iPads out there. Let's start scanning this. Let's start tying this into different third party solutions, uh, uh, procure or not procurement, uh, production tracking, things like that. So I think, the sky's the limit when it comes to developing solutions for this workflow um, because it's an underutilized and the burden of entry is so high that not enough people are playing here yet. So it's kind of a, a majorly under underutilized uh, principle in our industry. And I, I think it's it's worthwhile and it's worth the investment to start understanding what it could do for you and your projects. To your point, I, I think that's definitely somewhere where the industry as a whole would definitely benefit. There are a lot of different groups out there that have different tools and um, I, I'm sure like most of you we, we have to be pretty agnostic we have to use a lot of different tools there's a lot of different conversions um, to get what you need um, each has their strengths has their weaknesses and we're constantly going through that process on on the scanning and the software side just to see okay where's the industry at who's who's bringing new new technologies, new potential to it, but the ability to bring all those collective ideas together in a, a simple, efficient solution, I, I think is a, an amazing challenge, but definitely something that, that would benefit the whole industry. I will follow up with, with uh, what you're saying, James, uh, and I see the same thing. So one would be the part of visualization that give access to clients and everybody in the team to really quickly understand the space or even take a simple measurement, you know, not now to be able to access that data, it is pretty heavy and it is hard to, to anybody in the team to just open it and take some quick measurements. Uh, and the other thing would be translation. So how you take all that point, point cloud and you make it accessible to whatever platform you're going to use it. You know, we cannot restrict our, our users or whoever is, is working with this data to only work in one specific brand software so we cannot say well you if you get this one you use this tool to translate the data and now you need to use auto uh, revit you know or you need to use um archicad so it needs to be something kind of like ifc's you know that is is it can work across any platform and you can open this this file you know, in a sketchup if you want or rhino and you can get the same precision Visualization plays a key role in engineering design. Either your data is point cloud, a mesh, or a beam model. Now it is time to take a closer look at ODA's professional visualization engine. ODA Visualize allows you to add a professional 2D or 3D uh, graphics to any engineering application on any platform. Let's, let's take a closer look at what this technology can do for you. And I will start from a success story provided uh, by one of our oldest founding members, MSI Design. Last year, they have integrated our Visualize to their flagship computer-aided design application. And in the context of these samples, I would like to draw attention to the creative approach that allows to emulate feature which is only in our future plans. Here I mean reflection plane. Next demos illustrates how visual styles can create an impressive visual representation even for a simple model. Changing of a few visual style options like H model or H Chris angle can significantly alter the rendering and add different effects to the final model representation. Now MSI Design will tell you more about their experience with ODA Visualize. Hello, I'm Tim Olson, Vice President of Development at IMSI Design. I've had the opportunity to be involved with CAD development since the early 80s, close to 40 years now. And throughout that time, visualizing CAD data such as text, dimensions, line styles, wireframe, and 3D facet data have been a constant challenge. It's been a challenge because of the changes we've seen in the underlying software and hardware interfaces. And driven by our customers' ever-demanding need to support larger and larger files. 
Today, I'm going to share with you our experience of integrating ODA Visualize with our TurboCAD family of products. IMSI Design has been developing desktop and mobile CAD products since 1983. We have distributed over 16 million products during that time, targeting consumer as well as professional CAD and AEC users on Windows, Mac, Android, and iOS platforms. Our products include TurboCAD, DesignCAD, Floor Plan, and our Home Design Architectural Series. Our TurboCAD for Windows product is our first application to integrate Visualize. This product has extensive 2D drafting, annotation, surface and solid modeling, geometric constraints, parametric design, and an extensive suite of interoperability solutions. TurboCAD is used by our customers on a wide variety of platforms, ranging from integrated GPUs to high-end dedicated boards such as the NVIDIA GeForce. We need our rendering implementation to scale with the platform, providing all of our customers with the best possible experience. Our goal with Visualize was to update our rendering engine to improve performance, reduce our development costs by consolidating rendering engines, and to improve our customers' experience. Our first product to integrate Visualize with is TurboCAD. TurboCAD previously supported four graphic engines, including GDI, OpenGL, Lightworks, and Red SDK. Our render manager wraps these engines under one layer. Our approach was to add Visualize over a 12-month development period as a fifth rendering engine through two development phases. Phase one, we were to duplicate the current functionality into the TurboCAD 2021 release. And phase two, expose new features in the TurboCAD 2022 release. TurboCAD 2021 with Visualize was released last spring with positive feedback from our community of users. We observed two areas of notable improvements in performance and quality. Regarding performance, we saw up to 10x an order of magnitude performance updates for wireframe and 3D facet type data on high-end graphics boards, and 2 to 3x performance on lower-end boards. We also saw some unexpected quality improvements regarding anti-aliasing and ambient inclusion. Regarding anti-aliasing, we were able to expose methods and parameters to fine-tune those jaggies out of both wireframe and 3D facet type data. And with respect to screen space ambient occlusion, we were able to expose some simple lighting setups for users to quickly get more realistic uh, renderings. Next up are four things we believe helped us integrate and visualize into our TurboCAD product. First, the ODA Visualize team was very supportive in answering our questions, providing suggestions, and listening to our suggestions. I encourage anyone getting involved with ODA components to review the example code, use the online help, and get involved with the user forum. Second, as a founding member, we have access to source code. Source code provided us with the ability to step through the debugger inside the example code, as well as through our code, and provided us with additional insight into the workings of Visualize. Third, the ability to use two different versions of ODA libraries together in one application. This enabled us to update Visualize in a monthly manner without affecting the base ODA library, which is modified source requiring more time to update for us. And lastly, our lead engineer, Vlad Veselov, was able to leverage his prior experience with rendering engines towards Visualize. We found implementing Visualize consistent with other rendering engine concepts. With TurboCAD 2021, we duplicated our existing rendering engine to include ODA Visualize. With TurboCAD 2022, we extend our rendering engine with new features based on visual styles. New visual styles such as X-ray, conceptual, and gray along with customizable parameters will allow more ways for our customers to view complex data. In closing, our original goal was to be as fast or better than our competitors with our rendering engine while improving the overall customer experience. With the help of ODA Visualize, we believe we have accomplished that goal. Going forward, it is our intention to leverage Visualize into more of our products, including our Mac-based products. I look forward to our development team focusing more on creating unique product features where ODA components such as Visualize are a key component of that strategy. Thank you. Now we are moving forward with our presentation. There are many interesting things ahead of us.
The animation API allows objects within a visualized scene to be animated. Entity animation allows translation, rotation, and scaling to be applied to the objects in the model. Objects in ODA Visualize are stored in a hierarchical structure, and the animation API takes into account this hierarchy. For example, we can specify one animation for an entity and another one for its sub-entity, and the resulting sub-entity animation will be a combination of both its own and its parent animations. View animation introduces a new camera object that contains properties similar to the view. Using the camera object, you can create things like walkthrough animations for complex building models. Now let's talk about measurements. The ability to select and measure parts of a model is a popular feature for many types of design applications. For convenient management, Visualize supports options like nearest point, center point, start or end points, and so on. Also, we have added measurement tool to our sample applications, which can be used as a base for the adding measurement support to your client applications. Let's talk about highlighting customization and scene graph. Highlighting customization provides a way to control edge and face style color masks for highlighted objects. Transparency, displaying of the lines or contours, and uh, drawing order of uh, the highlighted geometry can be also controlled. In addition, we can use different highlighting styles in a rendering scene. Different parts of the model can be highlighted using different styles to meet the needs of even the most complex design applications. Similarly, this technique can be used to highlight different kinds of objects by most fit highlighting style. The next block of our presentation will be devoted to the visualized scene graph. It uses background processing of geometry data to minimize number of GPU calls and optimize rendering performance. We actively developing and enhancing this feature. Visualize uses a true-type font cache and block references cache to optimize vectorization performance and reduce memory usage for complex models. In the past, this reduced memory usage has come at the cost of slower rendering performance. This year, we have improved our scene graph to work seamlessly with our font and block caching, giving reduced memory usage without any serious loss in the rendering performance. Another critical SunGraph bottleneck is overall memory usage. We have reduced SunGraph memory usage by eliminating intermediate geometry data, which was previously kept to facilitate selection and highlighting processes. This table shows the benefits of this work for different models. During class here, we have significantly improved the screen space ambient occlusion, as SAO. It is a rendering technique which allows to add an effect of global illumination to the scene. First of all, now, we are using enhanced blur to avoid shadow noise. In addition, the SSAO can now be adjusted for the different zoom levels, either manually or in automatic mode. When visualizing AFC, in many cases, the full AFC model is divided into a set of separate files, electrical, mechanical, plumbing. OpenFC Viewer is now able to load all these files into a single scene. All uh, these models can be manipulated in Object Explorer pane. We can control visibility, perform selection, and many other operations, like, for example, collision detection between objects from different models. For example, we can test that an electrical equipment doesn't collide with plumbing. Also, we have added the new functionality to the collision detection palette to allow the transparency of the collided objects to be customized. This year, we have continued to work on Apple Metal Renderer for iOS and Mac platforms. Since Metal device invokes the similar code base with OpenGL S2 device, we have worked on a more deep unification of the data providing for these two devices. Also, we have added new functionality to the Metal device, like support of the stencil attachment, support of the index geometry, cutting planes. 
Another important feature is the frame buffer support. One of the benefits from the frame buffer support is a correct order independent transparency, even in multi-target mode. Our future plans with metal device include the transferring of the OpenGL ES2 geometric shaders to the metal, as far as the implementation of the advanced features like screen space ambient occlusion, fast approximate anti-aliasing, and more. Audio Visualize now supports multiple rendering devices for a single database. This means that client applications, for example, are able to run tiled printing or PDF exporting with optimal performance using graphic system cache together with on-screen rendering device. Previously, this was not possible. Another small enhancement is ability to draw background texture on faces in hidden line mode. This enhancement can be used to create an effect when background is visible through geometry. In contrast with classic hidden line, where constant background color is used to fill geometry. The next item involves raster images. Previously, we could select a raster image only by clicking on its border. Highlighting is also applied only to raster image borders. And now, Odea Visualize provides an API to enable selection and highlighting of the full raster image contents. A popular question on ODA technical support forum is uh, how do I uh, render a raster image with transparent background? And now client applications is able to request rendering of uh, 32 bits per pixel raster images with transparent geometry for any ODA vectorization model. Now we will mention a few final visualization features. And the first one is the transparency support in our GDI device, which can be used as for printing and for rendering. The next two options are related to the import part of the ODA Visualize. The first one allows us to generate a so-called 3D view during import of Revit files, if such view is absent. The second one is the ability to import data from frozen layers in DWG files. The last topic that I want to mention is the ViewCoop implementation. ViewCoop is a clickable object that allows you to change the current view. It is a quite popular tool in modern computer-aided design applications. Now it is time to discuss our future plans. First of all, we will plan to add the support of the reflection planes. The next topic is a fast object transform. This is a very important feature for an entity animation for the cases when many objects are involved in animation. Like, for example, is an explode tool. Also, we will plan uh, to add the implementation of the subpixel morphological anti-aliasing, SMAA, which should solve the problem with fast approximate anti-aliasing when one pixel lines appear to blur. We are now working, and we will continue to work on the new file format for the visualize, VSFX. This new format will reduce the size of the file up to 2.5 times and will support efficient streaming. During last year, uh, we have seen a strong interest to our application OpenAFC Viewer. And as a part of this interest, we have received a many request for the creating of the plugin system to this application. And we plan to work in this direction. Before we move on to next topics, let's see an interesting member case demonstrating a complex use of different ODA tools in cloud, including Visualize and Publish. Hi there, I'm Sean, the product lead at Lunar and Onset Design, coming to you today from Melbourne, Australia, and thanks for tuning in. In this talk, I'll run through a basic introduction of the Lunar Engineering Document Management System, or EDMS for short, and dive into some of the key ODA technologies that make our product possible. Onset Design is a small company based in Australia, and we specialize in everything related to engineering document management. We've been an ODA partner for a number of years, and we assist companies implementing EDMS to manage their CAD files. One of the key challenges faced by our customers has been receiving and reviewing large sets of drawings from their contractors. And we've historically used the ODA libraries as a part of a portal product to implement validations on receipt of drawings. This allows us to automatically check title block metadata quality, among other things, and speeds up the QA process, allowing as-builts to be received and processed more efficiently. 
Luna is a cloud-based EDMS hosted on Microsoft Azure that grew out of this original portal product. It's designed to allow smaller companies to get their EDMS up and running fast without the need for a complex design and config process. The key features of Luna are document upload, revision, review, and collaboration. We use a key set of ODA technologies to make these features possible. To show how the ODA tech fits into our application architecture, I'll introduce you to something that we call the Luna Document Processing Pipeline, or the journey that documents go through after being uploaded to Luna. Firstly, as documents are uploaded to Luna, they're automatically published using the Publish SDK to thumbnail and PDF. Thumbnails are used for previewing documents in our list view, whilst PDFs are used for document review and markup. Following this, we push the documents through the uh, drawings.net SDK to extract the various document metadata properties um, and store the title block and XREF data next to the document in Azure Blob Storage as JSON. This can be used for validation, metadata review, and more later on in the drawings workflow. When models are uploaded, we also push them through the Open Cloud File Converter, automatically generating VSF files, which can be used to view the ICF model IFC models in the browser. As our customers are starting to work with more model formats, we've seen an increased demand for the users to be able to view and navigate models in Luna without the need for an installed component. After looking around at the various model viewing options available, we finally landed on Open Cloud. Using OpenCloud, we've been able to enable customers to view IFC models as well as native DWG and DGN files natively in the browser without the need for first translating them to PDF. The next step will be to use the BIM RV Revit SDK to enable this functionality for Revit models as well. Whilst there are alternative methods to achieve some of these features, for example, 3D model viewing, they typically come with trade-offs, like requiring a model to be uploaded and stored in a separate cloud repository, which can be problematic when it comes to data sovereignty, or per model or document rendering fees, which can drive up the total cost of ownership for customers over time. By using the ODA libraries, we can maintain control of where our data is hosted and keep our prices comparatively low by avoiding rendering fees. So for us, it's been a huge step forward. And what's next? Well, going forward, we aim to further use the IFC and Revit SDKs to unlock some of the smart data captured in models, making it available to all Luna users. That's all for me today. And thanks for tuning in. Enjoy the rest of your day. New features added to ODA toolkits and especially to ODA Visualize give us the ability to provide a solution for another important task, a thorough design review of AAC models to validate multiple project aspects. This solution is a design review engine that evolved from a set of specific ODA technologies, visualize, publish, open cloud, common data access, and various BIM formats support. The major new capabilities we added this year to support a complete design review workflow are support for federated BIM models in Visualize and Open Cloud and two-way conversion between Visualize Toolkit and Navisworks database. For now, ODA Design Review Engine is a solution with advanced set of functionality. Import natively supported multiple design formats, IFC, Revit files, Navisvox files, DWG files with architecture, civil, and map data. Investigate an aggregated model with high quality visualization, fast selection, and highlight. Get access to all model attributes. Validate the model with advanced 3D clash detection. Use 3D markup tools to communicate project needs. Collaborate basing on open BIM standards such as BCF and prospectively open CDE. Publish entire model of or part of it to PDF. Exchange the model data with Navisvox files. This 
Design Review Engine features are available to extend your existing application or to create full-featured design review tools. When developing the Open Cloud solution, we tried to find a balance between stability, system security, and speed of adding new functionality. To do this, we deploy our solution to demo infrastructure to test new functionality and improve our stability. For the past year, uh, several thousand of users were registered in our application, which give us the opportunity to test our backend on real dataset. At the same time, we were able to test our new functionality in real conditions. Open Cloud support a wide range of file formats. For CAD, it's a DWG, DJN, DXF, and some others. For the BIM, it's uh, IFC, Revit, and Navis work. Also, we support some common 3D file formats. Some files use additional file resources. This can be a font file, textures, materials, and even external reference. To work with such complex files, we provide a reference API. You can upload all your files to the backend and link them together through the reference API. This mechanism is flexible enough so you can link your file multiple times. It can be used, for example, to create your own font library. For rendering files in the browser, we provide a Visualize.js library. This is a cross-compiled version of Visualize project into a WebAssembly format. It provides a rich API to work with the geometry data, to manipulate with them, or to create a new one. Besides this, we provide an API for different tools, like a measurement tool, a slice panel tool, and some others. We are constantly improving functionality of our Visualize.js library. From the latest improvements, we speed up the performance of loading geometry data. And we change the way of loading this data, which now is loaded the closest to the camera. Open Cloud Server provides an API to working with the users. Administrator can create new user and specify his specific settings and configuration. For example, you can create a user, specify his name, his position, the number of the project that the user can create, and the amount of storage that the user can use. For the convenience, these users can be combined into groups. Quite often on the real project, uh, it is necessary to specify the same project access for the set of the users. To do this, we provide a role-based API. You can create a custom role, change uh, per user permissions, and assign this role to your users or your groups. Open Cloud provides the clash detection functionality. You can use this functionality to detect intersections between objects in the scene and it provides an API to configure this uh, intersection detector. With the help of the Visualize.js library, you can highlight the intersected objects and show them. Another feature of the server is the file assemblies. This type of endpoints allow you to merge uh, several files into a single common structure. And then you can work with this structure as if it were a single file. Open Cloud provides a simple set of file operations. You can extract geometry data from the file or properties data. But sometimes it is required to execute custom jobs to extract additional information. To do this, Open Cloud Server provides an API to run custom jobs. For example, you can create such custom job to extract X data from the DWG file and send it to a separate storage with a notification. By default, 
Open Cloud Server use file system to store user files. This is a reliable and secure solution, but it requires additional administration and configuration. If this option doesn't fit you, we provide uh, access to the additional third-party storage systems. You can connect server to the Amazon S3 storage or Azure Blob storage. The server is powerful enough to withstand the load of a large number of users. During stress testing, uh, we use the server instance with one single core and two gigabyte of memory. The server in such configuration was able to handle 18,000 requests per minute. With one and a half requests per second for one active user, the server can withstand the load of 200 users. For the convenience of working with the open cloud system, we provide an open cloud CLI tool. You can use this to easily install and configure solution on your environment. For example, you need just only two commands to run our solution in Docker system. Welcome to our session on WebAssembly debugging. My name is Emanuel Ziegler and I work in the V8 development team of Google. V8 is our JavaScript and WebAssembly engine that is used in the Chrome browser, Microsoft Edge and Node.js. If you are new to WebAssembly and need a little refresher on it, don't worry, we will quickly present the knowledge required to understand this talk. The focus will be on how to debug and profile a WebAssembly application right in your Chrome browser. This can be useful if you have a bug or a performance issue that is hard to reproduce in native code. Of course, you may also just use Chrome out of convenience for not having to reproduce the error in another environment. In last year's talk, I gave an introduction to WebAssembly, or WASM for short, and how you can use it to bring your C++ code to the web. I recommend this talk if you want to know how to get started with WASM development. For now, all you need to know is that WASM is a low-level language that allows you to safely and performantly ship binary code on the web. Instead of a machine executable, WASM provides an intermediate representation that will be compiled just in time in your browser. WASM is available in any major browser, but I will focus today on Google Chrome for convenience. To create a WASM module from CC++ code, we will use the Inscription toolchain. WASM also supports other languages such as Rust or AssemblyScript with more to come. We will start with a simple example that simulates the collapse conjecture, which claims that if you triple the value and add one for odd numbers and half the value for even numbers repeatedly, you will eventually arrive to a loop consisting of the sequence 4 to 1 over and over again, provided that you started with a positive integer. If you are confused about what this does, don't worry. The details are not important for our investigations. We will be running this with different random numbers over and over for 500 million times. The problem with this implementation is that it does not work because it gets stuck in an endless loop. We now want to debug the algorithm to find the mistake and we can add debugging symbols and switch off optimizations using the minus G switch, just like with GCC or Clang. For convenience, I am creating an HTML file together with the WASM module and its JavaScript code. Using a special extension, which is still in beta testing, Chrome can read dwarf debugging information embedded in the module and we can navigate the C code directly. You can find the extension under the link in the slide. For the extension to work, we also need to enable an experimental feature in the Chrome Developer Tools settings. You can do that by opening the Developer Tools, clicking the little gear icon in the upper right corner, and then enabling the WebAssembly Debugging DevTools 12 support in the Experiment section. I have now opened the debugger in DevTools and set a breakpoint in the main function. After reloading, the program pauses at the main function as expected. You can see this from the pause in debugger message on the top of the page, as well as in DevTools, paused on breakpoint, and the breakpoint that I'm currently paused on is highlighted in the list and in the source code view. The scope on the right hand side contains the local variables. The local variable is still undefined at this point, but once I start stepping through the function, it gets initialized with zero and then with its actual value from the time function. Once I reach the scope of the for loop, the run counter also becomes visible. 
run is initialized with zero, and I not only can see this in the scope, but also when I hover over the variable. I will now put a breakpoint here so we can pause every time a new call to run example is made. I can either deactivate the other breakpoint or remove it completely as we don't need it anymore. We are now going to step into the function, but of course the first function to be called is rand and we therefore end up in there. As you can see, this function does not have debug information and we therefore are presented with a raw VESM code, which you can also see from the stack trace showing this little warning icon. For the C main function, I generated the debugging information, while for this automatically generated main wrapper, there is also no information. Below that, we find the JavaScript frames. You can see that the scope now shows information on the local variables in JavaScript. If I go back into RAND, we can see that I can step through this low-level WebAssembly just like the rest of the code. I can look at the local variables and as I keep stepping through it, the information slowly gets populated including the low-level stack. If you're interested in this low-level behavior, you can just step through your functions and see how it works. We are currently not interested in this, so I'm going to step out of this function and step into run example. We can watch the value of i change as I'm stepping through it. We now want to figure out why our algorithm does not complete, and I therefore continue until we reach the point where it fails. You can see that the breakpoint is not hit again, even though we should have completed one example in fractions of a second. So this means that we are still in the first call of this function. Let's pause and see where we are. We are still in run example as expected, and if I go one level up, we can confirm that this is indeed still run zero, and we really didn't hit the breakpoint. Let's go back into the top scope and see what's happening there. Let's take a good look at the number i and remember it for later. As I'm stepping through the function, the number keeps changing as expected. But then at this point in time, I end up with the same number that we saw originally, and this means that this loop is going to continue forever, and I will always toggle in between these two numbers and never reach the exit condition, as i never becomes 1. If you remember the Collets conjecture, you'll notice that something is not right here. We have an odd number here, and we should be multiplying it by 3 and add 1. But we end up in the branch that should divide by 2, but as you can see from the shift operator, it's actually pointing in the wrong direction here. So we got two errors to fix. Switch the if and then bodies and fix the shift operator. This should then be an accurate implementation of the Collis conjecture and we should exit each loop properly. Let us quickly fix the issue with the wrong condition by exchanging the if and else bodies. If we compare the performance to that of the native version compiled with Clang, we see that we are substantially slower. This only sometimes happens and if we simply reload the page, the performance is on par with the native version. Sometimes WASM is still a little slower, but it should come close to what you see in native performance. So why was our first run slower? In last year's talk, I explained that V8 uses a two-tier compilation strategy. This allows faster startup times while ensuring a high peak performance. 
In the beginning, it can happen, though, that the top tier has not yet completed its compilation when the program is executed. And because there is no on-stack replacement, it can happen that it stays in the baseline tier for the whole execution. This is usually not an issue, because if the program keeps returning to a function higher up the stack and then calls the inner function again, the new version will be called. In benchmarks, this might not happen, though, because of their simplicity. And the forced inlining of the run example function certainly does not help here. There can even be implicit inlining if the compiler notices that the function is not used outside the code. What works well in native code can therefore be a problem with WASM. So you might consider forbidding inlining of benchmarking functions that are called repeatedly. But why did it work the second time? That's because Chrome caches compilation results of the top tier, so they don't need to be recompiled again and again. On repeated runs, you will therefore likely start with the top tier right away. We now prevent inlining of the function, and we can see that the performance is now much more predictable. Or so it seems, at least. If I load the program with DevTools open, debugging will actually force V8 to use the baseline tier, leading to bad performance. This is especially confusing if you decide to output your benchmark results to the console and therefore keep the console open. It's better to run the benchmark first and then open the console to check the output. V8 will then run at full performance and you still have access to all the messages. If you want to run a proper function profile of our code, we should recompile it with a profiling command line flag, so function names which are normally stripped from the WASM binary are included. This also enables some other useful changes to the module, but if you do not want that, and you prefer just having the function names put in the module, you may just use the profiling functions flag. We can record function level profiles in WebAssembly using the Performance tab in DevTools. You can choose to press the recording button to start the recording immediately, or reload and then start recording. I will reload so my program gets re-executed. Once we start recording, the module will be tiered up so we can record the regular performance and not the one of the baseline tier. A few seconds of data suffice for our needs and when the profile is done, we can see that the majority of time is spent in script execution. Looking at the timeline, we see that we are mostly skipping in between two functions, the original main from the C file and the run example function. The gaps where run example stops executing is the time spent in main or the rand function. We can also take a look at the bottom up call graph, which features the functions in which most time is spent on the top. As to be expected, the majority of the time is spent in run example where the inner loop is, followed by original main with the outer loop and occasional calls to rand. The other parts only contribute to a negligible amount. We can also check from which functions this one was called, so we understand the call pattern. We can also look at the top-down graph, where we can easily see the path the program takes and on which branch it spends the most time. All of this works exactly like it does with JavaScript. For more complex programs, this provides useful insights for optimization targets that really help speed up your application. Thank you for watching this little speed run through WebAssembly debugging and profiling. If you work with WebAssembly, please try these features and let us know what you are missing most. Have a nice day and happy coding!